The following video for Anatomy and Physiology 1 covers Chapter 15, Special Senses. Part 1, Chemical Senses, Smell and Taste. The Structure and Physiology of Taste. The sensory organs for taste are known as taste buds. Roughly 10,000 taste buds are scattered about structures of the mouth, such as the soft palate, the inner surface of the cheeks, the pharynx, and epiglottis of the larynx. However, most of them are located in papilla, which are peg-like projections of the tongue mucosa that make the tongue surface slightly abrasive. These papilla are made up of three types, fungiform papilla, foliate papilla, and circumvallate papilla. Fungiform papilla are the most abundant papilla, with the highest concentrations being on the distal tip and bilateral aspects of the tongue. These mushroom-shaped papilla are known to respond to both sweet and sour tastes. The least abundant papilla is the circumvallate papilla. A normal person has anywhere between 6 to 12 of, 12 of these papilla, which are oriented in a V-shaped pattern at the proximal end or base of the tongue. These papilla are used in tasting bitter taste and assist in the gag reflex. All taste buds, no matter which papilla they belong to, consist of 50 to 100 epithelial cells of two major types, the gustatory epithelial cells and the basal epithelial cells. The epithelial cells are the receptor cells for taste. Long microvilli, called gustatory hairs, project from the tips of all gustatory epithelial cells and extend through a taste pore to the surface of the epithelium, where they are bathed by saliva. These gustatory hairs are the receptor membranes of the cell. Coiled intimately around the cells are sensory dendrites that represent the initial part of the gustatory pathway to the brain. Each of these afferent fibers receive a signal from several cells within the taste bud. Also located within the taste bud is the basal epithelial cell. Because of a taste bud's location, Taste buds are frequently subjected to friction and are routinely burned off by hot foods. Basal epithelial cells act as stem cells dividing and differentiating into new gustatory epithelial cells and replace taste buds every 7 to 10 days. Normally our taste sensations are complicated mixtures of qualities. However, all taste sensations can be grouped into one of four basic modalities. Sweet, which is elicited by many organic substances, including sugars, saccharin, and alcohol, sour, which is produced by acids, salty, which is produced by metal ions or inorganic salts, and bitter, which is elicited by alkaloids such as nicotine or caffeine. Keep in mind that many substances produce a mixture of these basic taste sensations, and taste buds generally respond to them all. However, it appears that a single taste cell only contains receptors for one taste modality. Also, while these taste receptors are thought to be divided up amongst the tongue anatomically, all areas of the tongue can actually be used to detect all of the taste modalities. The physiology of taste relies on a food chemical being dissolved into saliva, diffused into a taste pore, and then contacted by the gustatory hairs. Then the food chemical will bind to its appropriate receptor within the gustatory cell, which induces a graded depolarizing potential, thereby releasing neurotransmitter. The binding of these neurotransmitters to their associated sensory dendrites trigger generator potentials that elicit action potentials to these fibers. Taste transduction then occurs through three different mechanisms. Salty taste is due to sodium influx through sodium channels, which directly depolarizes gustatory epithelial cells. Sour is mediated by hydrogen, which acts intracellularly to open channels that allow other cations to enter. Bitter and sweet responses share a common mechanism, but each occurs in a different cell. Each taste's unique set of receptors is coupled to a common protein called gustucin. Activation leads to the release of calcium acetate from intracellular stores, which causes cation channels in the plasma membrane to open, thereby depolarizing the cell and releasing the neurotransmitter ATP. The gustatory pathway transmits taste information to the brain after it has been gathered by the cells of the taste bud. Initially, information is sent via three different cranial nerves. 
The facial nerve transmits impulses from the taste receptors in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, while the glossopharyngeal services the posterior third and the pharynx directly behind it. Finally, the vagus nerve transmits any information gathered by the few taste buds located on the epiglottis and the lower pharynx. These afferent fibers synapse in the solitary nucleus of the medulla, and from there impulses stream to the thalamus and ultimately to the gustatory cortex within the insula. Fibers also project to the hypothalamus and limbic, limbic system structures, which determine our appreciation of what we are tasting. The Structure and Physiology of Smell The organ of smell is a yellow-tinged patch, about 5 square centimeters, of pseudostratified epithelium called the olfactory epithelium, which is located on the roof of the nasal cavity. The olfactory epithelium contains millions of bowling pin-shaped receptor cells known as olfactory sensory neurons. These are surrounded and cushioned by columnar supporting cells, which make up the bulk of the penny-thin epithelial membrane. At the base of the epithelium lie the short olfactory stem cells. For us to smell a particular odorant, it must be volatile. That is, it must be in the gaseous state as it enters the nasal cavity. Additionally, it must dissolve the fluid coating the olfactory epithelium. Dissolved odorants stimulate olfactory sensory neurons by binding to receptor proteins in the olfactory cilium membranes, opening cation channels and generating a receptor potential. Ultimately, an action potential is conducted to the first relay station in the olfactory bulb. Olfactory transduction begins when an odorant binds to a receptor. This event activates G proteins, which activate enzymes that synthesize cyclic AMP as a second messenger. Cyclic AMP then acts directly on a plasma membrane cation channel, causing it to open, allowing sodium and calcium acetate to enter. Sodium influx leads to depolarization and impulse transmission. Calcium acetate influx causes the transduction process to adapt, decreasing its response to a sustained stimulus. As already noted, axons of the olfactory sensory neurons form the olfactory nerves that synapse in the overlying olfactory bulbs, the distal ends of the olfactory tracts. There, the filaments of the olfactory nerves synapse with the mitral cells, which are second-order sensory neurons in a complex structure called the glomerulus. When the mitral cells are activated, impulses flow from the olfactory bulbs via the olfactory tracts to the piriform lobe of the olfactory cortex. From there, Two major pathways take information to other parts of the brain. One pathway brings information to part of the frontal lobe just above the orbit, where smells are consciously interpreted and identified. Only some of this information passes through the thalamus. The other pathway flows to the hypothalamus, amygdaloid body, and other regions of the limbic system. There, emotional responses to odor are elicited. Smells associated with danger, such as smoke, cooking gas, or skunk scent, then trigger the sympathetic fight-or-flight response. Appetizing odors stimulate salivation and the digestive tract, and unpleasant odors can trigger protective reflexes such as sneezing or gagging. Part 2. The Eye. Sense of Vision. Structure of the Eyeball. The eye itself, commonly called the eyeball, is a slightly irregular hollow sphere. Its wall is composed of three layers, the fibrous, vascular, and inner layers. Its internal cavity is filled with fluids called humors that help to maintain its shape. The lens, the adjustable focusing apparatus of the eye, is supported vertically within the eyeball, dividing it into anterior and posterior segments. The outermost coat of the eyeball is the fibrous tunic, and it is composed of dense avascular connective tissue. It has two obviously different regions. The sclera, which is seen anteriorly as the white of the eye, and the cornea, which is the anterior transparent crystal clear window that lets light enter the eye and is also a major part of the light bending apparatus of the eye. The tunic, which forms the middle coat of the eyeball and has three regions, the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. The choroid is a blood vessel rich membrane that forms the majority of the vascular tunic. Its blood vessels nourish all eye layers. 
The ciliary body is a thickened ring of tissue that encircles the lens. The ciliary body consists chiefly of interlacing smooth muscle bundles called ciliary muscles, which control lens shape. The ciliary body is responsible for secreting aqueous humor, which is the fluid that fills the cavity of the anterior segment of the eyeball. Finally, the iris, which is best identified as the colored part of the eye, acts as a reflexively activated diaphragm, allowing more or less light to enter the eye through the pupil, which is a hole formed by the center of the iris. The neural tunic contains the retina, the optic disc, the optic nerve, the macula lutea, and the fovea centralis. The retina contains millions of photoreceptors that transduce light energy. These quarter of a billion structures are known as rods and cones. Rods are our dim light and peripheral vision receptors, while cones, in contrast, are our vision receptors for bright light and provide high-resolution color vision. The lens is a biconvex, transparent, flexible structure that can change shape to precisely focus light on the retina. It is enclosed in a thin, elastic capsule and held in place just posterior to the iris by the ciliary zonule. Like the cornea, the lens is avascular. Blood vessels interfere with transparency. The lens has two regions, the lens epithelium and the lens fibers. The lens epithelium, confined to the anterior lens surface, consists of cuboidal cells that eventually differentiate into the lens fibers that form the bulk of the lens. The lens fibers, which are packed tightly together like the layers in an onion, contain no nuclei and few organelles. They do, however, contain transparent, precisely folded proteins called crystallins that form the body of the lens. Since new lens fibers are continually added, the lens enlarges throughout life becoming denser, more convex, and less elastic, all of which gradually impair its ability to focus light properly. Also, as seen pictured here, a cataract is a clouding of the lens that causes the world to appear distorted as if seen through frosted glass. Some cataracts are congenital, but most result from age-related hardening and thickening of the lens, or are a secondary consequence of diabetes. Heavy smoking and frequent exposure to intense sunlight can increase the risk for cataracts. Oxidative stress and metabolic changes in the deeper lens fibers promote clumping of the crystalline proteins. Unexpectedly, supplementation with the antioxidant vitamin C may actually increase cataract formation. Fortunately, the offending lens can be surgically removed and an artificial lens implanted to save the patient's sight. Physiology of Vision as light passes from air into the eye, it moves sequentially as follows. First through the cornea, followed by aqueous humor, the lens, and vitreous humor. It then passes through the entire neural layer of the retina to excite the photoreceptors that are next to the pigmented layer. During its passage, light is bent three times. First, as it enters the cornea, then as it enters the lens, and finally as it leaves the lens. The cornea accounts for the majority of the refractory power of the eye. However, the refractory power of the cornea is constant. On the other hand, the lens is highly elastic and its curvature and light bending power can actively change to allow fine focusing. Our eyes are best adapted for distant vision. To look at distant objects, we need only aim our eyeballs so that they are both fixated on the same spot. The far point of vision is that distance beyond which no change in lens shape is needed for focusing. For the normal, or emmetropic eye, the far point is approximately 20 feet. Any object being viewed can be said to consist of many small points with light radiating outward in all directions from each point. However, because distant objects appear smaller, light from an object at or beyond the far point of vision approaches the eyes as nearly parallel rays. The cornea and the at-rest lens focus the light from these distant objects precisely on the retina. During distant vision, the sphincter like ciliary muscles, are completely relaxed and tension in the ciliary zone stretches the lens flat. Consequently, the lens is as thin as it gets and is at its lowest refractory power when at rest. The ciliary muscles relax when sympathetic input to them increases and parasympathetic input decreases. Light from close objects diverges as it approaches the eyes and comes to a focal point farther from the lens. 
For this reason, close vision demands that the eye make active adjustments. To restore focus, three processes must occur simultaneously. 1. Accommodation of the lenses, which is the process that increases the refractory power of the lens. 2. Constriction of the pupils, which occurs when the sphincter papillae muscles of the iris enhance the effect of accommodation by reducing the size of the pupil toward 2 mm. And finally, 3. Convergence of the eyeballs, which is controlled by somatic fi motor fibers of oculomotor nerves and is medially rotating the eyeballs by the medial rectus muscles so that each eye is directed toward the object being viewed. The signal that induces this trio of reflex responses is blurring of the retinal image. The vast majority of refractive problems are related to eyeball shape, either too long or too short, and not to a lens that is too strong or too weak. Myopia, or nearsightedness, occurs when distant objects focus in front of the retina rather than on it. Myopic people see close objects without problems because they can focus them on the retina but distant objects are blurred. Myopia typically results from an eyeball that is too long. Hyperopia, or farsightedness, occurs when the parallel light rays from distant objects focus behind the retina. Hyperopic individuals can see distant objects because their ciliary muscles contract almost continuously to increase the light bending power of the lens, which moves the focal point forward onto the retina. However, Diverging light rays from nearby objects focus so far behind the retina that the lens cannot bring the focal point onto the retina even at its full refractory power. As a result, close objects appear blurry and convex correction lenses are needed to converge the light more strongly for close vision. Hyperopia usually results from an eyeball that is too short. Photoreceptors are modified neurons, but structurally they resemble tall epithelial cells turned upside down with their tips emerged in the pigmented layer of the retina. These tips are the receptive regions of rods and cones, and are called the outer segments. The outer segments contain an elaborate array of visual pigments that change shape as they absorb light. These pigments are embedded in areas of the plasma membrane that form discs. Folding the plasma membrane into discs increases the surface area available for trapping light. In rods, the discs are discontinuous, stacked inside a cylinder of plasma membrane like pennies in a coin wrapper. In cones, the disc membranes are continuous with the plasma membrane, so the interiors of the cone discs are continuous with the extracellular space. Photoreceptor cells are highly vulnerable to damage and immediately begin to degenerate if the retina becomes detached. They are also destroyed by intense light. Rods and cones have different thresholds for activation. Rods, for example, are very sensitive, making them best suited for night vision and peripheral vision. Cones, on the other hand, need bright light for activation, but react much more rapidly. As vision leaves the eye, it follows the visual pathway starting at the optic nerves. At the X-shaped optic chiasma, fibers from the medial aspect of each eye cross over to the opposite side and then continue on via the optic tracts. As a result, each optic tract contains fibers from the lateral aspect of the eye on the same side and fibers from the medial aspect of the opposite eye, and they carry all the information from the same half of the visual field. The paired optic tracts sweep posteriorly around the hypothalamus and send most of their axons to synapse with neurons in the lateral geniculate nuclei of the thalamus. This maintains the fiber separation established in the chiasma but they balance and combine the retinal input for delivery to the visual cortex. Axons of these thalamic neurons project through the internal capsule to form the optic radiation of fibers in the cerebral white matter. These fibers project to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobes where conscious perception of visual images occurs. Some nerve fibers in the optic tracts send branches to the midbrain. One set of these fibers ends in the superior colliculi, visual reflex centers controlling the extrinsic muscles of the eyes. Another set comes from a small subset of ganglion dubbed the circadian pigment. These cells respond directly to light stimuli and function as the timer to set our daily biorhythms. Part 3. The Ear, Hearing, and Balance Anatomy of the Ear The ear is divided into three major areas the external ear, the middle ear, 
and the internal ear. The external and middle ear structures are involved with hearing only and are rather simply engineered. The internal ear functions both equilibrium and hearing and are extremely complex. The external ear consists of the pinna, which is the visible shell-shaped projection surrounding the opening of the external acu acoustic meatus. The external acoustic meatus, or external auditory canal, is a short curved tube that extends from the auricle to the eardrum. The eardrum, or tympanic membrane, is the boundary between the outer and middle ears. It is a thin translucent connective tissue membrane covered by skin on its external face and by mucosa internally. Sound waves make the tympanic membrane vibrate, which in turn transfers the sound energy to the tiny bones of the middle ear, which sets them vibrating. The middle ear is spanned by the three smallest bones in the body, known as the auditory ossicles. These bones, named for their shape, are the malleus, or hammer, the incus, or anvil, and the stapes, or stirrup. Tiny ligaments suspend these ossicles, and many synovial joints link them into a chain that spans the middle ear cavity. The incus articulates with the malleus laterally and the stapes medially. The ossicles transmit the vibratory motion of the eardrum to the oval window, which in turn sets the fluids of the internal ear into motion, eventually exciting the hearing receptors. The internal ear is comprised of the bony labyrinth, which is a system of tortuous channels warming through the bone. It is filled with perilymph, a fluid similar to CSF, and continuous with it. The bony labyrinth has three regions. First is the vestibule, which is the central egg-shaped cavity of the bony labyrinth, and it houses equilibrium receptor regions. Next is the semicircular canals, which also house equilibrium receptors. Finally, the cochlea, which is a spiral conical bony chamber that is home to hearing receptors. Auditory Pathway The ascending auditory pathway transmits auditory information primarily from the cochlear receptors to the cerebral cortex. Impulses generated in the cochlea pass through the spiral ganglion, where the auditory bipolar cells reside, and along the afferent fibers of the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nuclei of the medulla. From there, neurons project to the superior olivary nucleus, which lies at the junction of the medulla and pons. Beyond this, axons ascend in the lateral lemniscus to the inferior colliculi, which projects to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Axons of the thalamic neurons then project to the primary auditory cortex, which provides conscious awareness of sound. 